Uh, first of all, thank you, Stephen. I really appreciate your words. And uh, I'm really honored. This is actually our first uh, tech field day for Weka IO. Um, we are a young company, but we have some very exciting technology and uh, are looking forward to today and uh, getting your participation in the event. So with that, I'm quickly going to turn to our agenda. And uh, I thank Stephen because he gave us a lot of coaching before this event and said, please start with the what. Because um, some companies start with the why and you're halfway into the evening and you still don't know what they do. We're going to start with what we do, what we make, what markets we serve, and why we are the ones that can serve those markets. Liran will then come on and he is going to take you deep into the technology, into our core IP that differentiates us from everybody out there and really sets us apart in this space. And finally, um, Shimon is going to come up and join us and actually give you a live hands-on demo of Weka IO, uh, showing you some amazing performance numbers. So with that, let's firstly turn to uh, Weka IO and what we do. We believe that we are the fastest, most scalable parallel file system for AI and technical computing workloads um, that ensure your data, your, your applications will never have to wait for data. That is our promise that we can deliver to um, application customers. In terms of the actual product, um, we have a deep storage roots inside the company from great uh, luminaries in the industry. Uh, we get to stand on the shoulders of giants like IBM, NetApp, EMC. Um, our founders, Liran, you'll meet later, uh, are were the uh, founding core team of XIV. So we have great storage roots, over 20 years experience between us, um, and we know how to build great storage products. Um, since we've launched the company, we've actually formed some very important partnerships that I want to make sure you get covered today. First one is Hewlett Packard Enterprise. We announced last November at uh, Supercomputing 2017 that we are going to be a key component of their portfolio for their high performance computing space. Um, in addition, another key one on here is uh, Supermicro, who we partner with extensively in terms of our go-to-market strategy and being able to deliver our software. Um, and finally, last but not least, Amazon uh, Network. We are now an advanced partner already um, in our young life as a company within the Amazon Partner Network. Um, and we are available in the cloud on the marketplace. You can actually use Weka.io today if you want to. Um, as well as that, we've had some uh, recent wins in terms of accolades, including uh, CRN, um, CIO Magazine, we've had Tech Trailblazers, and also Storage Magazine um, Product of the Year Awards. Uh, and this again is with a very young portfolio. So what do we do? Um, we believe we're the only parallel file system that's actually built for NVMe and taking advantage of NVMe over fabrics. If you look at the storage industry, when we cared about speed, we always went for SAN infrastructure. Um, and today you'll see these things like the all flash arrays that we've talked about. Um, so running on flash, but running on a fiber channel SAN infrastructure, that's how you got block speed into your applications. If you cared about shareability and simplicity, NAS was the product of choice. Um, it started in the early days with NetApp and their um, NAS. And then obviously we went to scale out NAS with companies like Isilon. And if you really cared about scalability, um, parallel file out, scale out NAS was the uh, technology of choice, uh, products like Lustre or GPFS. But if you really care about exascale, the cloud and object store was the way to get that technology. Each one of these, whether it's scale, simplicity, or speed, is its own dedicated technology core and once you've committed to that technology core, you're pretty much stuck there. What we did at Weka.io is we took a look at these key components and we said, how can we build an infrastructure that pulls together the best of all three and present them as one unified structure within uh, our product portfolio? So for Weka.io, what we are is a software-only solution. We do not sell hardware. That is really important because I think we've reached a point in the infrastructure, um, in enterprise, and in hyperscale, where people are very comfortable with understanding how to manage underlying hardware. What people are looking for is software as a service, and that's how we provide our storage solution. We can scale to trillions of files 
and billions of files inside a directory. This is, this is truly a hyperscale product. Um, we can scale to hundreds of petabytes um, and millions of IOPS and hundreds of gigabytes of bandwidth. So think of this in the league of the most high performance parallel file systems, but with the lowest latency, um, even better latency than you'll get from an all flash array. And last but not least, we're delivering it with cloud economics. So sound too good to be true? Uh, let me tell you how we're doing that. First of all, um, WECIO is a matrix, is the name of our product. It's a shared file system. It's a fully coherent POSIX file system that delivers actually better than local file system performance. And we'll show you some numbers later that demonstrate measured by customers where we have beaten a local NVMe drive as a shared file system. It's fully distributed coding. So we're taking advantage of technologies like data distribution. Um, and that ensures that when you're dealing with an underlying technology like NVMe flash that's very expensive, that we can deliver you great economics on that, but also great performance. As you will see with the technology, we are a scale-out infrastructure. The more you scale this infrastructure, the more resilient the product becomes. And people often have a hard time with this because we're used to a RAID environment. But with our technology, because we distribute data and because we're fully distributed, distributing data actually ensures that you have less data and e pieces of data on each machine. And then when you have any failures, all of those machines get to participate in the rebuilds. So rebuilds are very fast and data protection is very solid. And last but not least, we actually have end-to-end -end data protection, which is something you typically only see in uh, block storage services. In terms of other key features, um, we have a very mature product for what is actually a very young product. Um, from day one, we've had snapshots, and our snapshots are instantaneous snapshots, so they're extremely high performance. Um, you can create a writable snapshot, so you now have cloning if you're in a DevOps environment. Uh, we also allow things like tiering to S3. So I talked earlier about being able to get the performance of all flash array, but the economics of object store. Built in from day one in our product, we have built in the capability to integrate disk-based storage to the technology so you can tier internally within the product from a very high performance NVMe straight to disk. And we do that by leveraging object store. And last but not least, we allow things from that, back from that object store like partial file rehydration. So imagine you've got 10% uh, of your data on hot tier because that's your working data set. You can have 90% of your data on much lower cost object store. So you're not having to incur 100% of the cost of NVMe just to get that high performance 10%. If you have a very large file, which as you will see later in the markets we address, uh, very large files is quite common. If you want to change one small sector of that file, the last thing you want to do is wait until you've rehydrated the entire file back into SSD. What we allow you to do is take little tiny chunks of that file, bring them back into SSD, modify them without the need for the entire file. So you can see that the integration of the technology from day one to be able to do those kind of tricks is key to the, tech, is key to the product we've built. And last but not least, how you deploy us. Um, we support uh, InfiniBand as well as Ethernet. So we can completely fit into a high performance environment as well as a more traditional enterprise environment. We go all the way up to 100 gig Ethernet. Um, and you can deploy us because we're software. How you deploy us is your choice. You can deploy us as a traditional storage-like <coughs> appliance, which we call dedicated server. Or you can apply us in a hyperconverged model, much more like what you get from Nutanix. Because we're a storage service, we can just be one other piece of that service running in your server infrastructure. Um, and then how uh, we actually physically sit on that hardware, we can be an application um, on bare metal, we can be containerized, um, or we can run in a VM. And as I mentioned in the very beginning, we can be 
on dedicated hardware inside your uh, enterprise, or you can uh, run us in the public cloud. And in fact, we have the ability to, to bridge between those two as a hybrid infrastructure. So this is an example of a typical dedicated storage server. You can see here, very much like your appliance model, uh, we typically come out 100 gig Ethernet out of those. That's what we recommend. But this is a dedicated layer of NVMe. It actually can be SSD or SATA as well. So we support all of the flash uh, technologies in, in disk. You can have um, a dedicated Weka I.O. client, which will give you the highest performance, um, well over 2x what you can get from any of the, of the other protocols. Um, and you can also have connectivity via NFS, uh, by HDFS, or, or even SMB. And we also can run um, very, uh, very well with uh, GPU servers. Now, how we get the uh, economics that we talked about earlier is internally in the product, we tier to an object store. So this is your disk-based platform. And we manage the, the allocation of data down to that disk-based platform. It could be based on a time-based series. So you could say, after 30 days, I want everything that's on my flash tier to be pushed off to disk because I don't need it anymore. So our tiering policy will allow you to do that. It can also be based on your ingest rate. So if you're ingesting data very fast into that hot tier, we will proactively push the colder data down to the object storage tier so that you always have a room in, in your primary tier. The key thing from an application perspective is that everything is managed as a single global namespace. So as far as your application is concerned, everything feels local, even if 90% of your data is sitting on a tier below that in the object store. You never have to change a single line of code in order to be able to get this functionality. So we're not about data moving, we're about integrating the disk tier back into the overall file system. The other way you can deploy us, I mentioned earlier, is in hyperconverged mode. So if you are talking about a greenfield environment, um, you might have decided that your next generation of architecture, you're going to buy a server class that allows you some amount of small, small amount of SSD in that tier. Um, frankly, even Blade servers have the capability of putting a small amount of flash. And if you have very large clusters, we can take the SSD within that uh, hyperconverged model. We require a core, that's our minimum footprint, one core about 10 gigs of memory, and we containerize ourselves into um, our own dedicated um, instance inside that machine. So we're completely separated from your applications, and we're also contained within the amount of uh, resources you give us. We get no more than that, that's all we're allowed. We then share the uh, network, yes? So, so I just wanna make sure I'm clear on this. So, the web, so, so it looks like on the on the client machines of the file system, you're, install, you're installing a Weka I.O. client on those boxes that access, you're taking a core from the client yeah. to access the, the storage? Yes. So it's kind of an Intel SPDK thing, I guess? Uh, where you're taking a core for the NVMe? There is a DPDK layer. Uh, you can choose to dedicate a core, or you can choose not to dedicate a core, and then our client will uh, cycle up uh, the CPU cycles as needed. Okay, but I also noticed in the slide before that you had NFS and HDFS would their performance be less if they were accessing via those types of protocols versus using your Weka client? Definitely, the Weka client is, the, is optimized to give you the best performance. NFS and SMB are another connectivity methods uh, that allows you to ingest and uh, outgest uh, data from the system. But uh, as Barbara mentioned, we've measured uh, more than twice performance using the Weka driver over the same workloads. Okay, thank you. And in the hyper-converged mode, do you both have the client and the server software running, is that how that works? That is correct, yes. So effectively, um, think of us as just another store, another service or another application running within that. Um, and we're taking over some of the resources and then key to it, we're obviously still giving you the ability to tier to your cold object tier, 
So from a, from a logical perspective, nothing's changed. It's just physically you're sharing a, a server versus having a dedicated server. And all of it, again, is managed within a single namespace. And what we actually find with customers is that this really is about where they are in their, uh, in their um, buying cycle of being able to um, integrate server and storage. Because typically, um, in more traditional enterprise environments, we find that there's um, a TikTok where one year they buy server, the next year they buy storage, um, and they tend to manage their budgets that way. But we're seeing more and more of a trend to wanting to unify that infrastructure into a single cloud infrastructure, which effectively this is now. Now you have a cloud. Now you can have services, different services running on it. <coughs> and your storage is, again, part of that service. What's key about the software is it's already there. This isn't something we're building in the future. This is something that's already deployed in the field. Can you have both a hyper-converged environment as well as a storage, dedicated storage node? Does, does, Definitely. Does Weka IO? Absolutely. Definitely. Yes. And More importantly than that, um, as you build out your infrastructure, each of those servers that you add to that cluster can have a different profile. They can have a different SSD because SSDs have matured. We have the ability internally to take what will be a growing and changing environment. So it's not a requirement for, even though my Diagram looks cookie cutter. It's not a requirement to have a cookie cutter exact same servers. Um, we can continue to build on the generations of servers. And then you can start to retire potentially in, in the background the old ones. And from a hyperconverged perspective, what's the compatibility list right now in terms of hypervisor supported? So um, may maybe I'll find you. When we say it's hyperconverged, it's not necessarily running on hypervisors. It can certainly run on VMware, on Zen, on KVM. It's running in Amazon, and you'll see it. Right. Uh, but it can also, and we, that's what we see, that the most high-performance environments prefer to run it uh, on bare metal. Uh, we're actually installed as an LXC container on your bare metal Linux. Right. And uh, we're separated. We use an, our own, um, actually, Barbara will get to that. But uh, on a bare metal environment, in, it, in terms of uh, hardware support, uh, any, any probably we'll, we'll see the logos, but everything x86 and uh, just to add a bit uh, not only hypervisors or bare metal we support docker so we have uh, a volume plugin and kubernetes so and actually for docker and kubernetes we allow them as you probably saw the logos on the previous slides uh, we allow scaling of containerized applications because up until now customers need to make sure all containers that access the same file system run on the same server because once you start sharing them performance drops since we show that we actually provide higher performance than a local file system you don't have that requirement anymore and you can actually now start scaling containerized applications thank you so one of the other key things about the technology, um, because we're software, we really are able to disaggregate the view of capacity and performance. If you take an appliance, one of the challenges you have when you purchase an appliance is you buy a cookie cutter block of pre-configured capacity with a predefined storage platform. With us, the way you define storage performance is by the amount of cores you give us. So you give us more compute, you get more performance. And it really is as simple as you know, double the amount of compute power. You're, you're effectively doubling the performance that you'll get from that system, completely independently of what's happening from a capacity perspective. Um, likewise, we actually have the ability to do this dynamically. So if you have provisioned your storage and you have a particularly demanding user who says, I'm not getting enough performance into my application, you can actually designate more of the compute resources to them. Likewise, um, you can also shut them down um, at a later date and return them back um, to the compute environment. We can scale um, the actual uh, clusters. It is a scale-out system. Um, you can scale that out to you know, a massive scale over time. It doesn't have to all be done in day so, one. So you mentioned the storage operates as, uh, can operate as a container but it can also operate as a VM uh, as well, is that? Definitely, it yes. can yeah. also be installed on top of a VM. So uh, you can actually aggregate a number of VMs to be a storage cluster. 
and VMs can also consume, co connect to a worker cluster and consume that storage. And we, we're going to have uh, s some more examples in the deep dive uh, yeah. later on. So uh, I, I uh, will answer all of your questions. Yeah. Um, so. Last but not least, I mentioned this at the very beginning, but it is very important. We are native in Amazon Cloud. You can go to the marketplace, and you, we even have a cloud formation tool that you can use. Um, and it's completely self-configurable. Um, here's an example of how you can use us in a compute environment. So you can have most of your storage on S3, which is considerably lower cost. It's about a tenth of the cost of EBS. You can have the storage uh, being consumed into I-series instances. And then what we do is we massively improve the performance that you actually get into the cluster. So you can almost think of us as almost like a cache but it is a persistent storage layer. You can run this um, ongoing as, as some customers do. They're running this as their uh, storage environment with most of their data on S3, but us as the way that they get the performance into the applications. Um, and likewise, obviously, if you want to do it on a bursty nature, you can have an instance of S3 spun up for some period of time, uh, run your application, get the performance you need, which you can't get directly from S3, and when you're done, you can shut that down, and we allow you to actually snapshot the file system back into um, S3. I mean, obviously, the network at AWS that's available to users is not 100 gig from the nodes, right? So, so your performance in AWS must be mitigated a bit. So we uh, Go ahead. Yeah, you, 10 gigabit is the <coughs> limit on what we get currently right. in AWS. You're absolutely on our, right. The, on R3 instances or on 10 gigabit instances, some gigabits uh, can go up to 25 gigabit, and then we can utilize that. Well, I mean, they got the, if you get enhanced networking, right, exactly. you, have, you have to say there's some best practices around doing that. You can't just get it. So you have to be, you know, local, everything has to be in a local peering group, right? So um, it should be in the same availability zone, in right. the same region, and then you get the best performance. Uh, we can also uh, scale across availability zones, uh, and then I actually wanted to show you, this is actually a screen capture of a customer testing us at scale inside of Amazon in hyperconverged mode. This is 300 instances. This is, by the way, is, uh, what I'm really showing you here is our GUI. It's very, very easy to use. But it happens to be a real life customer environment. Um, we show you the data protection levels, 16 plus 2. You can see here, um, inside of a shared noisy network inside of Amazon, we were getting over 10 million IOPS on 4K um, IOPS. More importantly, the actual latency is 692 microseconds. So even within that noisy, not so um, ideal network that you would have on premises, we were getting less than 700 microseconds across a shared network inside of Amazon. You bring that on-prem on 100 gig, you're going to be down to 190 microseconds across a shared network. And so this guy is actually using S3 tiering as well, or is this This, this one was, uh, is, uh, right now the numbers you're seeing are all running off of SSD, but in this instance you can see there is an object storage attached. I, you know, that was uh, probably doing some benchmark testing um, between the object store and the thing, but the actual performance numbers you're seeing are being run off the um, S3 instances. And by the way, one other thing, this is SATA SSD, not NVMe. Right. If we were to do the same test today on the i3 instances, you would see hugely more improvement numbers than this. Right, so actually on, uh, on NVMe, we run native. So we have our own ISTAC that we manage the NVMe devices. For SAS and SATA, we have uh, a backward compatible mode where we're using the Linux ISTAC because we cannot virtualize them uh, to our operating system. Uh, so when we were running here on the R3 instances, it was backwards compatible Linux SATA stack, and uh, our stack running on the Intel 10 gigs. Actually, I3 instances have 25 <coughs> gig uh, ENA, so the um, the new NIC from uh, from Amazon, which we are intimately integrated with. So in ENA, you are getting our NVMe of the fabric stack running on AWS with NVMe devices. 
and uh, we've shown latencies, I think, as low as about 170 microseconds to applications. So these are not block 4K IOs. These are actually IOs consumable by applications using standard system pools. Thank you. Wait a minute. Huh? Uh, you said that you support NVMe over Fabric uh, in, a in Amazon with, with the right level of instances. Is that what you said? Exactly. So you've uh, have, you have other vendors talking about how they're doing yeah, NVMe yeah, yeah. of the Fabrix for TCP. We've actually, and we'll get to it in our deep dive later. We've implemented our own over Fabrix protocol in software only over standard Ethernet that does not require PFC. So, and we also run on the extremely noisy Ethernet network of AWS, which is where we debug our stack because there is no better network to debug a network stack than AWS. And, and, and you're capable of getting 170 microsecond latencies in an AWS environment? Yes. With i3. On i3 instances, we'll yeah, yeah, be yeah, running. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's more Amazon than, I mean, it's, <laughs> well, it's because Amazon's giving an on-prem capability. You know, 170 microseconds is not bad for an AFA high-end storage SAN environment. Not bad, it's great. In AWS, it's unheard of. Yep. All right, th thank you very That's much. part of the technology. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's part of the core IP. So uh, quickly, what markets we're focused on. This is a great product for general high-performance computing, but we've released that targeted on four key markets that we're going after. Um, as a young company, I think it's really important that we do maintain a focus. So we are focused on machine learning and uh, things like uh, image recognition, um, image matching, um, digital radiology and digital pathology um, as well, which also has a very strong machine learning component. Um, algorithmic tra trading, and this includes things like uh, time series analysis, so KDB plus, and also uh, risk analysis, uh, as well as um, genomic sequencing and drug discovery. So here's what they all have in common. All of them have millions of small files, all of these four use cases. All of them are very metadata intensive. All of them are very latency sensitive. And all of them have a need for a lot of capacity. You take any genomic sequence, you're talking a terabyte per person by the time they're completed with that single uh, instance. Um, and last but not least, all of them have huge exponential growth in terms of the, their actual market spaces. So that combination of the very hot flash tier and the very, very deep lake, data lake we provide you below with an object store, whether it's on-premises or in the cloud, brings together the capabilities that really ideally suit this market. So why WECA.io and why now? Um, we believe that we're the only company, if you look at the three things I talked about, speed, simplicity, and scale, we're the only company that can actually solve all three. So today, in terms of scale, you have Luster, uh, Panassas, um, IBM, and uh, more recently, BGFS. When you talk about simplicity and scale out NAS, you have the traditional players like EMC, uh, Cumulo, Pure Storage, all great companies building great technologies and give you great scalability. Um, but what they don't give you is that parallelism that you get from the more traditional uh, Lustre file systems, for example. And then speed, you talked about NVMe over fabrics. We have a lot of companies that are coming out with an NVMe over fabrics um, infrastructure, all focused around block storage. If you want shared file on top of that, the only way you get it is by layering something like Lustre or GPFS on top again, and now you've obviously gone backwards. We provide all of these capabilities in a single software infrastructure. There's one I miss at this, this slide, and if I listen to you, it's, I'm not totally sure where I should put it, but it's Elastifile. We heard of them too, yes. so where would you put them in this? I think I would put them still within, I think they're still playing here, but they just have more of a hybrid cloud infrastructure. But it's really a scale out NAS. It's traditional cool. NFS and SMB. So yes, um, I think if there was a fourth dimension, which was a cloud component, mm -hmm. and I did actually think about adding that, but then I thought I'd really <laughs> confuse you, I would agree that they would be there. But I contend that we'd also be in the fourth component. Sure, yes. yeah. 
Um, as far as I know, they haven't implemented the parallel file system, so they yep. couldn't be in the top circle. And obviously, they're not doing NVMe of the fabric, so they cannot be in the right circle. No. Okay. So one of the things that makes us particularly, our, our time to market particularly uh, relevant is what's happened with the um, development of GPU servers. So we've taken what used to take 10 CPU servers and compressed that into one single GPU server, which is great for on the compute side. We've seen a, a, you know, a, a huge 10x reduction in that shrinkage. But at the same time, you've seen a 50x growth in the amount of storage that's actually being consumed by those applications. So these two worlds coming together is really an absolute I.O. nightmare. How do you get 10 times more, 50 times more data into one tenth of the, of the footprint? 100 gig ethernet obviously helps, but it's not gonna help enough, and it really requires um, a new approach to it. So one of the problems is the traditional way of getting shared storage into those environments, like a GPU environment, was NFS. <laughs> and I have an acronym for NFS, it's not for speed. If there's one thing you walk away for today, not for speed. The most that you can get out of an NFS into a single GPU is about one to one and a half gigabytes per second. This is not a function of the boxes here, it's a function of the, the protocol itself and its ability. This is a protocol that was invented in 1984 for the problems that we had in 1984, and it's still trying to solve a problem in 2018. We contend that you, couldn't, you can't do it with NFS. You cannot saturate that GPU server with NFS. PNFS tried to do this, but once the metadata uh, load got extremely high in these boxes, uh, PNFS is not able to handle that either. Um, and the problem with legacy parallel file systems is they were really built around large file, bandwidth-oriented, disk-oriented uh, workflows, and they really are not well suited to small file with billions of small files with lots of metadata. Um, and by the way, I would contend you need a PhD to operate at least one of them. What we do at WEC.io is we give you the full bandwidth into that GPU server, and we can guarantee you that, that we will saturate the link to your GPU server. Um, and obviously, key to that is uh, the fact that we are super low latency. Um, the fact that we actually support InfiniBand is also a huge benefit because you don't have to have separate infrastructure for your GPU cluster and your storage cluster. We can run the entire thing on InfiniBand uh, as a single infrastructure. Do you OEM your software stack to... Um, do you work with the OEMs for your software stack to partner that out? I'm sorry, I missed the question. You asked about OEMs. D d are OEMs using our software? Yeah. Yes, I talked about HP at the very beginning. So today we have HP, um, uh, uh, who is uh, selling our software. It was announced last November, so it's public information. Um, and uh, we'll actually be doing some stuff again with them at the GPU conference. Um, but we also have a recent relationship with Supermicro as well. So our view is you buy the hardware, um, you deliver the software either through your OEM, or you can obviously uh, deliver it through the channel. The channel partners can buy them as Absolutely. part of their price book. Yeah. Okay. So this is one of the things I wanted to show you in terms of our ability. If you look at workflows, and this doesn't have to just be a GPU workload, this could be a genomics workload, it could be many different applications. But we have the ability to come in on the ingest side to a single file system over SMB. It could be SMB over, for example, your microscopy machines come in SMB or uh, sequencing machines, or it could be an IoT device coming in over S3. Um, we can handle uh, the cleaning and tagging that has to happen in the AI workflow with uh, HDFS. You can run that straight against the same storage server. Um, and then when you move along to the actual heavy intensive training sessions on GPUs, um, you can use our POSIX client to get the highest performance into that GPU cluster so that your GPUs are actually being fully utilized. And then as your data set grows, and by the way, just to give you an idea, um, you're looking at 50 to 100 petabytes of storage is what they typically will expect from a relatively small feed, uh, fleet of autonomous vehicles per year. So 100 petabytes a year coming in from a small vehicle fleet, can you imagine what it's going to be if it's a 100 fleet? Um, this is a absolutely massive data sets that they have to not alone collect, but also preserve for posterity, because there's actuarial 
uh, risk as well associated with that. So how does this, something like a, an S3 ingest work in this environment? So if a microscopy device creates an S3 object, is that mm -hmm. what it would Effectively, it will come in. And then, then, then you would somehow ingest that into Weka IO as a as That's a right. File? Our front end can speak multiple languages, and internally, we then can serve that back out to another protocol. So you have your own S3, your own object store database that you're keeping. Is it, it's not just a file system, it's, regular, it's an actual regular object store. S3 compatible? So we, we actually let you access the same data through all interfaces. So you're going to put a file in the S3 bucket. If it didn't have slashes, it will all just be plunked in the root directory. If the name, if the key of the S3 put has slashes, it will actually be placed in the right the directory, directory through that, uh, from the root directory of the bucket that's associated with the file system that you're exporting. And then once S3. there, it's just another file that can be accessed through any of the protocols available. Right, exactly. and, then, and then you can access it extremely high performance with our POSIX interface, or if you have a Windows machine through SMB, or if you have an older AIX through NFS. But when, when you put in an object, do you get an object ID back? Like a regular object ID, like, like you would in S3, or you always access it through the file? Object ID. So well, that's what it, I'm asking. So uh, you, there are actually two ways if you want to get a bit deeper. So you could actually mark that bucket to be object only, and then uh, it will be slightly higher performance because there won't be directory creations and traversals and these are the things. Also, when you could do a get, it will just go through a single bucket. And uh, as we've discussed before, our directories scale m more than standard uh, object storage buckets. So we can have billions of files in a single directory and it scales very well. So for us, a directory with a billion of files works as well as a directory with a thousands of files. So we don't have the metadata scaling issues of previous file systems. So you could say, hey, I'm ingesting or putting files via S3 to a file system that also supports other accesses. And, and then there will be slightly more overhead of parsing it, creating directories, placing it in the right place. And then it will be accessed through HDFS, POSIX, SMB, or NFS. Or you're going to say, I want lowest latency object. I don't care about uh, the other um, semantics. And then just treat that directory as a huge bucket. I don't care if you have slashes. Just make it an object. And this works as well. So you, you, you have the two options. Uh, so, so, so effectively, then, you're, you're controlling, let's say, some number of buckets on S3. And I happen to be a microscope, and I'm generating this data. And I just put objects in there effectively. And if I want to, I can use a directory. Or if I don't want to, I don't have to use a directory. But then they just show up in your file system. Exactly. You, you're actually putting them on the Weka. And, and We would push them if needed to the S3. And then and you're going to get as low latency yeah. as you're getting from some of the caching solutions. So uh, now people have Redis services or Memcached services doing key value. We provide, because we just have a more efficient stack, similar latencies, not out of RAM, out of NVMe, but the data is fully is coherent and fully consistent. So you're not going to have any coherency issues like a fleet of Memcached servers. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank okay. you. How do you guys plan to uh, move fast in those uh, you know, markets like AI, you know, HPC's kind of workload, right? Um, you know, a lot of other vendors are actually jumping into the same space that you guys are. Are you guys looking into things like appliances and so on? So are you talking about us actually building an appliance? <coughs> yeah. So I'll get to that very quickly. Actually, that's a great segue. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, San Diego Supercomputing has been a key partner of ours from the very early days in terms of testing the... Um, capabilities of the product, and also they were one of the companies that really are one of the places that really helped us uh, validate our InfiniBand technology, because obviously you need more of a high-performance compute environment for that. Um, so we uh, uh, work with them very closely, and uh, obviously 
um, it's a key validation of the technology that you get into that. But I think your go-to-market is exactly where I'm going with this. Um, we expect that probably no more than 30% of our sales would be direct. That's really not the route to market. We think that the way to get to market is via the OEM partners, like you mentioned. Um, so we've partnered with HP Enterprise, also Penguin Computing, who's very big in high-performance compute as well as GPU-intensive workloads. Um, and then, obviously, the key resellers that are pushing uh, more uh, high-performance storage systems. So that's how we see our go-to-market. But in terms of um, the delivery mechanism, our goal is never to be an appliance vendor. I think the days of appliances and customers wanting to buy appliances and pay the margin stacking on appliances is over. We want to partner with companies like Supermicro. Um, and this is an example of uh, an engineered solution is how we describe it, um, which basically is taking commodity hardware just like, frankly, a lot of the other appliance vendors are doing. Uh, the, uh, this is a joke, by the way. There really is no Weka I.O. here. You really are buying Supermicro. But what's inside is, is our software. So we'll be coming together in the channel, and this actually will be something available through Supermicro. And we just define, we pretest, we engineer this in our labs, we pretest it with them. The key thing that you get is you get huge performance advantage on our product uh, versus what you'll see with traditional appliances. And you're paying half the price because their margin stacking isn't there. Um, and the last thing is no maintenance contracts. Um, so this is the bottom line is uh, we sell software. We don't sell um, you know, appliance with maintenance, which is effectively like saying, you've bought my box, and now you have to pay to keep it working as well. Um, and we have things like configurators. So this is just an example of what we provide to our partners so that they can very easily say, if I buy two of the big twin, I'm going to be looking at about 35 to 40 gigabytes per second and two and a half million IOPS. And we can even do things like give them the approximate capacities. So based on uh, whether they're taking small or very large drives, we can very easily um, codify the solutions. And these are available today and what we sell. Or other vendors as well? We, we, I gave you the example of Supermicro. Same thing with HP. Um, on the Pro line and the Apollo line, mm -hmm. um, so similar, uh, for example, the DL360, we love that product. Um, so that's just a good example of the way we're creating the um, engineered solutions that our channel partners can then uh, leverage and go to market with.